G'day everyone, lovely to see you here today. I want to uh, begin by speaking to you about the topic of expectations. Let me ask you, how do you deal with other people's expectations of you? You know something's coming up and you know that there's an incident or an event, there's, there's something that you're going to have to perform a particular way. How do you deal with that? I remember meeting my prospective father-in-law for the very first time. Let me lay the scene for you so we completely understand one another. My father-in-law was a recently retired Qantas pilot of 30 years, very, very impressive uh, resume professionally. Uh, he was and has been divorced multiple times, not a Christian, infamously ill-humoured, and also, my wife, girlfriend at the time, informed me, looked uncannily like George Clooney. <laughs> For you who are under 30, George Clooney was an actor uh, who <laughs> has been... <laughs> ER, check it out, it's amazing. Uh, so you've got that guy there, then you have me. I was, I beg your pardon, I was 30 years old, divorced, two children, in between jobs, and my next job prospect was looking at Christian ministry, amazing. Uh, beyond all that, I was covered in bad tattoos and slightly older than my wife. Just, what's eight years between friends? So there I was. <laughs> desperately needing and seeking this man's approval and yet absolutely petrified. The big night came. We went to a Belgian restaurant. Have you been to a Belgian restaurant? No. Why? They don't have many of them. <laughs> I was so scared and nervous that I went and got a long sleeve shirt to cover my tattoos. Unfortunately, the only one I could get was a woolen jumper. Um, I walk into the restaurant and it was like entering into the pits of hell. There was an open fireplace. It was 75 degrees. If you've never seen sweat patches through wool before, uh, you've never lived, okay? I was just, bleh, bleh. I was like the Northern Irish students here for the last six weeks, you know, just, bleh, bleh, just sweating it out continually. I go over and there's my father-in-law to be. I put my hand out to shake his hand and I knock his beer over <laughs> onto his lap. And that was the highlight. <laughs> Fast forward 20 minutes, we'd run out of things to talk about, it was awkward chit-chat. And my wife, slash girlfriend, decided to tell him a funny fact about me. She goes, ah, oh, Dad, guess what, I just found out something very funny about Dave. He can't drive a manual. Now, <laughs> ladies, if your brother, husband, boyfriend, father, uncle, fellow student, if they can't drive a manual car, this is a matter of deep family shame <laughs> to them. They know they can't drive, they're hiding that they can't drive a manual car, and you'll notice that, because they'll always pretend that they can, but then go strangely absent if they ever have to. When they're hiring a car, they'll always demand to hire an automatic. These things happen all the time. Many of you can't do it and will never admit to it. But you're not lying because you think you can, but you can't. I couldn't. On the way home that night, as Sam was dropping me home, in her manual car. Um, <laughs> I said, Sam, why would you say that to him? This is a man who can drive an aeroplane. <laughs> and she looked at me with the look of someone who has not just like remembered that this guy can't drive a manual, but is also an absolute moron and said, Dave, you don't drive aeroplanes, you fly aeroplanes. <laughs> Now, there's two questions at the centre of every expectation. Every time we have expectations, two questions circling around. One obvious, one not so. Here they are. Number one. What do they want from me? Are you with me? Sudden a new school, new job, new college, new sporting team, new relationship. What do I need to do in order to be accepted here? How do I need to behave in order to be brought into the fold? What do they want from me? But number two, less obvious but equally important... What do they want for me? In other words, is what I receive worthy of the price of admission? What is it that I'm actually reconnaissancing here for? What am I actually hoping to achieve from what I'm about to go through? What are they delivering to me? What are they giving me? What do they want for me? And is it worthy of me going through everything I need to do to get there? My friends, we're going to spend most of our time this morning looking at um, that stunning, astonishing uh, collection of words in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And as we do so this morning, I want to ask you to consider both of those questions. What do they want from me? What do they want for me? But not insofar as how we relate to one another or joining a sporting club or a college or anything like that, but rather, number one, above all else, 
to consider these questions in the light of how you relate to God. What does God want from you? What is it that he is seeking to get from you? How is he hoping that you will behave in order to be accepted by him, to bring you into the fold? What do you need to do to become a Christian? What do you need to do to go to heaven? What does he want from me? But secondly, what does he want for you? What benefit do you get from being accepted by him? Why bother being a Christian? My problems haven't gone away through being a Christian. They multiplied. I don't know about you. Why bother? Is it worthy of what we're doing here? What is God offering us by being one of his people? Before we look at that, let me just offer um, what should be an obvious, but we need to remind ourselves continually, truth. This is not theoretical. This is not fighting a war with Nerf bullets. This is not a game. What we're looking at this morning is not an academic discussion. It's a question of life and death. The question of life and death. And death of utmost urgency, urgency for you, for every single one of us here, but also, dear friends, please, every single person you will ever meet. It couldn't be more important. So, not that the prayers before didn't work, but rather just to help us refocus ourselves on what we're about to look at. Let me pray again quickly um, and then look at these incredible words in Romans 5. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take us away from the distractions of our mind, our heart and our soul. As you speak, help us listen. And not leave here the same, but continually transformed, changed. That we love you more. And we grow more and more uh, in the image of your son Jesus. In our character, inside in our soul. Father God, we pray this in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. So question number one, what was it? What does God want from me? In other words, what do I need to do to be accepted by God? Well, have a look at chapter five. The key, of course, very, very helpfully to us in answering that question is discovered in the very first word of the very first verse of chapter five. What do we read? Therefore, therefore. Now, of course, every time we read that, we need to ask, what is it there for? It's a very, very important word, particularly in this context today, because it means in order to understand what you're about to read, it's critical, crucial that you understand what you have already heard. You will not grasp hold of the magnitude of what the Apostle Paul is writing to us in Romans chapter 5, unless you can grasp hold of what it is that he has said up until this point. So what has Paul been saying? Well, as I... Trust many of you will remember already, Paul has been painstakingly painting a picture for us of the reality of life. The reality of life for humans, the reality of life between humans and God, the reality of our relationship with him. And what he says is truly shocking, offensive, disturbing, horrifying and astonishingly beautiful. So what is it that he says? Well, we actually see a hint of it in chapter 5. Look at verse 6 to verse 10. What you notice here in chapter 5 is that the Apostle Paul begins to speak to Christians in the past tense, speaking about who we used to be. If you indeed are a Christian here today, this is for you. This is what we once were. But what I want you to do as we look through verse 6 to 10 is focus on those past tense and realise this is a resume of every single person You've ever met the resume of you before Christ. What does it say? Verse 6. We were what? Powerless. We were ungodly. Verse 7. Certainly not righteous. Unrighteous. Certainly not good. Bad. Verse 8. Sinners. Now, sin is one of the most ill-defined and misinterpreted and misunderstood words In the world. We're going to look at two others, but sin is right up there. For many people, what do you think they hear when we say the word sin? Well, they'll generally think of it as breaking rules. They'll either talk about it really big, you know, terrorism, murder, whatever, or really small. A white lie here or there. But Paul makes it clear that whilst those are examples of sins, that is not the power of sin nor the definition of it. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. Our sin towards God is not the the slightly bumbling 
innocent actions of someone in neutral in our relationship with God, minding our own business. You, you see this, of course, when we say, oh, that's low-hanging fruit. That person over there, they're low-hanging fruit. They're close to being a Christian. They're so good, all they need is a bit of Jesus. They're pretty much already Christian. That is a wicked lie. Why? Because the Apostle Paul in verse 9 and 10 makes it clear that not one human being is minding our own business, neutral in a relationship with God, but rather we are enemies of God. We were. If you're not in Christ, you are. Our sin is warfare, open warfare. It's our sin that has created enmity between us and God. And my friends, that is the core of sin. Please never define sin as the breaking of rules. Think of it as the breaking of rule, of turning your back on the rule and reign of the Most High, of rejecting his control, his command, his call over your life. Yes, the consequence is a broken relationship, but before even the broken relationship is a rejection of his rule and reign over your life. It's a breaking rule. The rules are the symptom of that broken rule. Now, the result of all this is there is coming a day when our, day, our lives will be laid bare and the terrifying truth is that the righteous judge, God and his son, will stand in judgment over us and we will be found guilty. We will face God's wrath. Hell is not the absence of God like a vacant room. The fire of hell is the wrath of God. There's nothing we can do to fix what's being done. Do you understand how utterly offensive what we're saying is to the outside world and yet how utterly misunderstood? Let me ask you this question. How many of your non-Christian friends, family, colleagues, whoever it is, do you think know what we've just said? Oi, how many? Zilch. Hardly any. What do most non-Christian people believe we're obsessed with? Morality. Morality. You saw this two years ago. Andrew Thornton became the president of the Essendon AFL football club. If you're from overseas um, and you don't know what AFL is, let me just describe it for you in three words. Waste of time. Um, (laughs) If anyone invites you to an AFL game, (laughs) delete their number. If anyone calls the Sydney Swans the Swannies, they're unaware what that sounds like to the rest of us. Okay, just... And if you're from Northern Ireland, the game came from Gaelic football. Okay, so you work out what that means. But it's not good. Waste of time. Andrew Thornton became the president of the AFL Football Club. Less than, a, less than a day later, had to resign. Why? Because, shock horror, it was revealed that he was an elder at a reformed evangelical Anglican church. Those revolutionary Anglicans. An Anglican church. The head of the Australian Liberal Party, Peter Dutton, called the views held by this church on sexuality and abortion... An abomination. That's the Conservatives. Dan Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, said that such views were completely out of step with community, plain and simple bigotry, and have no place in our modern culture. The pastor from Thornton's church went on television and locked horns with a much-loved TV host. The TV host blindsided him. It was amazing, amazingly terrible to watch. How can you believe such things? They come from an ancient book. You're making people feel unloved, that a particular group of people are going to hell. What's happening here? A complete misunderstanding of reality. These people are obsessed with the idea that we're obsessed with morality. But the very thing that distinguishes us from every man-made religion and philosophy on earth is that we are not obsessed with with morality. It's not in the top thousand things that should occupy our minds. But more to the point, in their shock and horror at our morality, they are blinded to the far more offensive truth at the centre of Christianity. The offensive truth at the centre of Christianity is not what we say about homosexuals, and it's not what we say about trans people, and it's not what we say about abortion or euthanasia. The far more offensive truth at the centre of the Christian gospel is what God says about all of us. Sinners, rebels enemies. We will spend an eternity in hell and it is what we deserve. My friends, it's utterly critical that we understand that. 
It's utterly critical that we grasp hold of that. It's utterly critical that we work as hard as possible to make other people understand that. Why? Because unless you see the blackness, unless you see the darkness, unless you understand the pure horror of what the Bible reveals to us, you will never grasp hold of how astonishing, utterly astonishing, what the Apostle Paul writes for us next and is right at the centre of the Christian gospel. In the, in the shadow of that darkness, now, in the present tense, allow me to read for you chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. On our own, we are enemies of God in warfare and God facing an eternity in hell, which we deserve. That is justice personified. That is what we deserve. And yet we read the most scandalous truth of all. God justifies sinners. Only bad people go to hell. I beg your pardon. The other way around. Only bad people go to heaven. Only evil people are justified. Wicked people are forgiven. But how? Look again. We are not justified through our empty actions, through being religious, through going to church, through being baptised, not through praying this way, praying that way, eating that food, avoiding that food, not through charity, not through social justice. We are justified through faith. Now that's the second word which most people, of course, don't understand. Most People who aren't Christians, when they hear that word, what do they think of? If you can't see me, look up. They think of that. Blind faith. They define faith, and it's a valid definition, as the belief in something with no evidence. But of course, that is not Christian faith. Christian faith is not blind. The Bible's definition of it is trust, confidence, dependence, not despite the evidence, but because of all the evidence of life, of creation, and the word of God. Of course, it's a type of word that we use millions of times a day in action. Think of the seat that you're sitting in. You're sitting in the chair that you're sitting in because you trust it will hold you. And of course, it's crucial that we understand that the key to understanding trust is that on its own, it is nothing. Trust is nothing more than an intellectual agreement. It's what you trust in that matters. When you sit down right there, what are you sitting on? Trust or the chair? Trust will not hold you. <laughs> it's the chair that allows your trust to be activated. We are justified through faith. Evil people made righteous through what? Not trusting in ourselves, but rather verse 8 and verse 9. And my dear friends, it's my delight to read these words. These were the words that were read to me the day I became a Christian. As a result of reading these words, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were good, not when we were holy, not when we were righteous, not when we got our acts together, not when we stopped doing this or stopped doing that, but while we were sinners... Since we've now been justified by his blood, whose blood? Jesus' blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Why did Jesus die? My friends, if you want to have an evangelistic conversation with someone, let me encourage you at some point as you're having the spiritual engagement, the dialogue, ask them this question, why did Jesus die? Not because we're good people, but because we're bad people. His death is what justifies us. It's what saves us. Because he died at the will of his father. He is the one person qualified to die in our place. The perfect son of God. The Messiah. God made flesh. And in his death, our guilt was punished. But not in the sinner, in the son. We can be justified. Around six years ago, 12 young boys and their 25-year-old coach were trapped in a cave in Thailand. Does anyone remember that story? It's in the documentary. They were caving on the ground and the tunnels flooded. Now, when they initially realised that 
absolute danger of their situation, what did they try to do? Well, of course, they tried to get out themselves. There was two major attempts. Firstly, the coach tied a rope around himself and dived into the tunnel to try and swim out. But he almost died in the process. Why? Because it turned out that the, the, the flooding was so severe that it would have taken three hours of swimming underwater. It was impossible. The young boys and their coach then tried to dig their way out by digging up into the rock. They dug four metres. It's impressive. What was the problem? The 800 metres of rock above them. They could not help themselves. They could not rescue themselves. Their situation was entirely dark. And yet, what did they not realise? What they couldn't possibly realise was that in the nine days they were stuck underground, the world above them had gone to work. Do you remember that? It's one of those few times where humanity bonds together. People from everywhere were coming up with ideas and plans. I'm pretty sure Elon Musk took a Tesla over there or something. <laughs> ran out of battery, he couldn't do it, but he tried to do this whole range of things. But nothing that they did, no plan they had worked. They thought, well, Beryl, we'll, we'll go down to get them, but the rocks would have collapsed and crashed them. We'll swim under with scuba divers, but then how would you get the boys back? They'd panic, they'd freak out. It was a three-hour swim through twists and turns, through ups and downs. Impossible. And yet, amongst the seven billion people on earth, it turned out there was one person, just one, qualified to not only come up with a plan but put it into action. And that man was an Aussie. His name is Richard Harris. Richard Harris is the world's only scuba anaesthetist. Why would you become a scuba anaesthetist? <laughs> it's like being an astronaut cello player or something. So, okay, well, sure. Richard proposed the plan that the scuba divers would need to go into the tunnels all the way in and then anaesthetise the kids, knock them out, put masks, oxygen masks over their faces and tie them to the scuba divers. If they didn't, they'd rip the masks off, they'd freak out, they'd panic. What needed to happen in order for it to occur? What did the boys have to do? Nothing. All they needed to do was trust. Trust their rescuer. And that's exactly what happened. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it stunning? They could not help themselves. My dear friends, what did they have to do? Trust him. How do we get right with God? What does God want from us? The answer? Nothing. You can't give anything. All you need to do is trust, believe, have faith. And the very act of doing so is a gift of God in the first place. Jesus Christ walked to this earth to die in your place. Now, I've got to tell you, I've been around more college long enough to know that the, the odds are there are people in this room who are not Christian. My friends, if that is you here, it's not too late. He died for you. He rose from the dead, verse 25 of chapter 4, for your justification. His resurrection secured your justification. Come to him. But of course, now the question is, if that's what God wants from us, what does he want for us? Is it worth the cost of admission, or is it a little bit like queuing you know, for a restaurant or queuing for some sort of uh, movie or show and you get midway into the queuing process and you just go, stop it, I'm out. It's not worth it. Well, the answer to that question is as profoundly put in verses 1 to 5 as you will see anywhere in literature. And I'll read this out. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, pay attention to the benefits of salvation. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith 
into this grace in which we now stand, what do we have? We have peace with God. Not peace with God like John Lennon, peace with God, like a hippie, peace with God, like the cessation of conflict, peace of God. Relational reconciliation, shalom with God. We have access by faith into grace, the undeserved generosity of God which continues to flow in which we stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. My dear friends, there's a... There's a um, an enormous pile of benefits and blessings, God's love, the Holy Spirit poured into your hearts, peace with God, the reconciliation of God. And yet there's one word there that strikes me, that grabs me, that for these Christians, 10 years off, Nero, with the suffering to come and the ordinary suffering of Christian living, they're given something to cling on to. What is it? We boast in the hope of the glory of God. My friends, through God's past actions, through his present blessings and future assurances, we have hope. And hope is that third word which we need to understand, do we not? It does not mean a spiritual crossing of your fingers. It's not wishful thinking or optimism based on on, on desire and fantasy. Hope is a steadfast belief in God's faithfulness the confident expectation and assurance of future blessings and fulfilment rooted in his promises, fulfilled and provided and poured out to us through the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the reign, the rule of Jesus Christ. Hope is not shaky. It's not fickle. It's solid. It's real. And it changes everything. God promises that if you trust in Christ... You are justified, unreservedly, eternally. You are justified. And when you screw up and you stuff up and you think you're disqualified, you may be disqualified from ministry, but your sin does not disqualify you from the kingdom of God. It qualifies you for his continuous grace. Return to him in repentance and faith. Your salvation is not based on what you do for God. It's based on what he's done for you. Your salvation is secure. Your sin is no more. If your faith is in Christ, it means you can trust that God is always, always, always only at work for your good, even when it's suffering, even when it hurts, even when it's Greek, even when it's Hebrew, (laughs) even when it's heartbreak, even when it's cancer, even when it's physical or emotional devastation or relational breakdown or heartache or heartbreak or misery in stress and worry and concern, in jealousy, in death. Hope means we can persevere in the knowledge that our perseverance is not based on our own goodness and strength, but the endless, endless perseverance of the heart of Christ. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Priceless. Let me say one thing quickly to finish. My friends, that is the reality of our lives as Christians. What does God want from you? Nothing. Trust. Trust him. What does he want for you? Everything. (laughs) Hope. Eternal life. Secure. Peace with God today. Reconciliation. Justification. My goodness. But what about the people that you know? What do they need? They don't need us to go around and fluff their spiritual pillows and tell them how special they are. They don't need us to come to them and help them vacuum carpets and feed hungry people. Those things are terrific to do, great, wonderful. But for dying people facing the wrath of God for eternity, what do they need? The gospel. The gospel. And that must be the tune we follow, the drumbeat we march behind. If you want to be like Christ, 
How do you hope to do that? Unless you have a heart that weeps for the lost, that cares for the damned, but who has hope in the promise of eternity and the saving power of the gospel. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every good gift you give to us and we thank you for your son Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection on our behalf. That we can be justified through faith, the gift of God, not of ourselves. Lord, let us be captured by that. And I pray, Father, for those who are stressed and anxious, worried and depressed, who find college overbearing, life all-consuming. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us that we are at peace with you and that the peace of God give us assurance, confidence, rest. We pray for those that we know who don't know you. We pray for salvation. Use us, Lord. Please, use us. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.